We are so grateful and we're so thankful for Lord giving us another day. Giving us a new day. A new day that we never seen. We never saw. The Lord is still blessing. And he is grateful and he is faithful. He is faithful. Listen, listen to what James said. This is this is it. This is our effort in the morning before we get into our morning devotion. Um, listen to what James chapter 4 says to us beginning at verse I want to say uh, uh, I should have read that so we're looking at James 4 7 says listen to what he says think about the week that you had prior to the day think about all the times that the Lord has provided for you he, 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 he gave you traveling mercy and traveling grace. You woke up, you was able to inhale and exhale. You had the activities of your limbs. Uh, God is just so grateful and faithful. And too often we take all of that for granted. We take that for granted like God had to do it. No, he didn't have to do it. And the reason why we're standing here today because there's still work that God has for you to do in this body. Amen. And when he get done with us, he'll know it. You will know it because we'll be up there with him. Amen. But James 4, 7 says to us, listen what he says. It says, submit yourself therefore to God. Resist the devil. <laughs> he didn't say put him behind your back. He didn't say stand on top of him. He said, resist the devil. And he will flee from you. Ain't that good news? Let us pray. Eternal God, our Father, we come. We come at this time, Lord. We come recognizing your love, your grace, and your mercy. Father God, we come here to hear a word from you. We pray, Lord, that you will open up our hearts and our minds, God, that we can hear from you. We ask you to speak to our pastor today, Lord. Oh, God, let a word come through him. That, Lord, that we will be able to hear it, but not only hear, but, Lord, benefit from the word. And, Lord, after all is said and done on today, we will be careful to give you the praise, the honor, and glory. It's in the matchless name of Jesus we pray. And all the people of God say together, amen, and praise the Lord. He is coming to this house, gathering in his name to worship him. Let's worship in spirit and in truth. We have come. We have come into this house. Gathered in his name to worship him. We have come into this house and gathered in his name to worship him. We have come into this house, gathered in his name to worship Christ our Lord. Forget about ourselves. about so forget about yourself magnify his name we want to worship this Christ alone let's lift up holy hands 
church school class. Thank you. That's going to make me just dig that much deeper. That's all. That's all. I just keep reading, keep studying. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's intercessory prayer time. And the song said, forget about yourselves. Concentrate on him worship him and this is our intercessory prayer time worship so let's let's look at the other let's redeem the person better than you are and let's lift them up to the Lord is anybody on the prayer list that's not on the prayer list and the Lord put them on your heart call them out to the Lord in the secret closet so let us pray for the jail ministry Reverend Richard L. Reverend Richard Curry, Sister Miriam Ruth Newsom, Cora Clayton, Brother Richard and Sister Easter Sneed, Sister Dolores Scott, Jennifer Rainey, Sister Hilda Myers, Reverend Matthew Quarterman, Brother Willie, and Sister Patricia Fairbanks, Sister Gwendolyn Thomas. Sister Alberta Bowden, Vanetta Jackson, Brother Carlos Robinson, Reverend Theodore and Sister Mary Johnson, Brother Michael Hazel, so uh, Sonia Queen, Sister Jamesette Wallace, Latoya Hall, Sister Hattie Wallace, Brother Michael Sutton, Brother Quint Wallace, Reverend Kenneth and Sister Faye Jefferson, the Reverend Fred Friday King, Sister Kimberly Hardiman, Sister Blondina and Brother Herbert Caswell, Brenda Sapp, Brother Samuel Ballinger, Sister Phyllis Luckett, Dale Stringfield Jr., Sister Dorothy Johnson, Sister Michelle Walker, Quentin McCall, Linda Wright, The Hill Family, Sherry Cox, Sister Ramel Howard, Brother Bobby Tucker Jr., Valencia Sutton, Brother Ivory Godwin, Brother Nicholas and Sister Andrea Jiggins, Lois Smith, Sister Cynthia Kendricks, Trey Hobby, Brother Adrian Limbrick, and Cuz. He's here again today, not by mistake. Sister Melvinia Simmons, who's sitting in her lofty seat on the front row. 
Brother uh, Herbert, Herbert Fitzpatrick, Sister Carolyn Campbell and family, and Brother Darrell D.A. Austin. Let's lift up St. Joseph family. Father, we thank you today for Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. And that knowing without him, we can do absolutely nothing. Knowing that without him, we couldn't even trust what your word says. Because he left us a comforter, the Holy Spirit and said he will guide us into all truth. So thank you for him, the Holy Spirit, who guides us into all truth, who breaks down the shell that we have built up around this, this flesh, peels off layers, and he lets us know that he want us to, to love one another, to pray for one another, to forgive one another, to be compassionate towards one another. So we just want to thank you this morning. Thank you for waking us up. Thank you for bringing us here in your house of worship. Thank you for calling us into your service this day. And now we ask that you will forgive us of our confessed sins. As we are confessing them even now in our secret closet, Lord. Because you are faithful and just. Help us to walk into the light. Because as we are in the light, you cleanse us. Then as you cleanse us, you ask us if we get crazy, just confess it. And agree with you that we are sinners and we need your forgiveness. So now breathe on this prayer list as only you can today. Uh, whatever you have for this prayer list, Lord. You know all about everyone on it. That's why we're lifting it up to you. Even those that we are praying for in our secret closet, Lord, we're lifting them up to you because you know all about it. You set the stage. And you are running the show. So whatever your will is, have your will. And give us the wherewith to say thank you. Give us the grace we need to say thank you to whatever your will is. And then breathe on the St. Joseph family as only you can and unite us together as a family, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Help us to love one another. Help us to, to fellowship with one another. Help us to forgive one another. Help us. Then breathe on our pastor as only you can. Touch him in a mighty way today, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Help him to feed us so we can feed others. Then as he finishes his message on this day, our prayer is together that you will save and add to your church as such should be saved. We lift up this prayer in the only name that you have given to where man must be saved, even Jesus our Christ. And let the church say, Amen. And praise the Lord.
yourself how many times that we try to keep ourselves we we utilize the resources that we thought we had our family members our friends our jobs our um, our titles none of that none of it can keep you like Jesus can <laughs> Oh, yes. I had family turn your back on me. I have friends that turn your back on me. Jobs, they downsize. They don't tell you. <laughs> I'm 
trying to help somebody as I'm helping myself. But to be kept by Jesus. And when you'd realize that you would be nothing, absolutely nothing, because it's Jesus doing the keeping. I tried to keep hold of Jesus, but I slipped. I tried to hold on to him, but I let him go. But when I realized that he had me, he never let me go. Even when I strayed away, he had his hands around me. When I tried to walk away, he put his arms around me. I'm kept. <laughs> oh, bless his holy name. I'm kept. I'm kept. I'm kept. I'm kept. Oh, bless his name. I stand now for the reading, for the reading of our scripture. Turn with me to the first epistle of Peter. Chapter 1. And we have been instructed to read verses 3 through 8 in a, in a response manner. And then verse 9 all together. Again, 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning at verse 3 through verse 8, we will read in a response manner. And then verse 9, we will read all together. And when you have it, will you please signify by saying amen? amen. Oh, bless his name. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundance mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Who are kept... <laughs> by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. <laughs> that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found in, unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. All receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. All oh, blessed and reading of the living word of God and to be kept by the living word of God. Amen.
definitely wounded for me. And I do pray that the rest of you can make the same claims because it's by his power at the cross that made the difference. My brothers and sisters, I don't care what someone stand up and preach. If they don't preach the power of the cross, there has been no sermon preached. When Jesus was given his instructions to us before he left this earth. He only gave one, and he says, preach. Go and preach my word. Go preach my gospel. Go preach. And that, that tells us that the power is in the word. Amen. And when the word is preached, then changes can happen. If the word is not preached, changes can't happen because there is no conviction. The only reason that you know that you've broken the law when you run through an intersection is that a stop sign is there. Yeah, if the stop sign is not there, you haven't broken any, any, any laws. You might still get hit in a T-bone, but you haven't broken no law. But if the stop sign is there and you run it, you have broken the law. And so God tells us that very same thing in his word. He tells us how to live a life that's pleasing to him. And we can only get that in the study of his word and in the preaching of his word. His word is paramount. The Bible says everything else will perish. Everything else, all the good stuff we do, all the singing we do, and God knows the singing is beautiful. All the deaconing and even the preaching and everything else that we do, God says it's going to fade away. The only thing that's going to be left when he does this cleansing in the final day is his word. Is his word. That's the only thing that will, that, that will make it through the cleansing. And so if you are tagging yourself to anything else other than God's word, then my brothers and sisters, I'm here to tell you that by the word of God, you will be vanquished, you will be destroyed, you will be... <laughs> away in the same way that uh, everything else like vapor he says will just be taken away but my word will stand forever just before we get into the, the sermon those of you that see the uh, uh, the robe you know that's what they normally call it I, I, I call it a covering and the reason why I call it a covering is because in my studies and everywhere else as I stand as the pastor, as the called man of God, I stand representing the Lord Jesus Christ. I stand as an under-shepherd, 
And as God speaks through me, I speak to the people. And so the robe or the covering just represents the fact that I am covered by the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That I'm not a pastor that's uncovered and I can jump up here and preach whatever I want to preach out of my mouth. That's not what a pastor is called to do. Amen. It is not for me to, to give you all what I have, 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 have learned from the seminary and throw it out there. That is not what a pastor is called to do. He's called to preach the word of God. He's called to lift the word of God. He's called to represent the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So the, the, the robe simply represents the, the covering of an under shepherd. Amen. And so as you stand, as I stand and you see, it's, it's not the fashion, although I think it's fashionable, <laughs> but it's not the fashion that's going on. It is the representation that I am covered by the Lord Jesus Christ. And, that I, and I recognize that, and I dare not step away from that because I'm scared to death of God. I'm scared to death of him. I, I remember Pastor Rim used to say that, and I used to grin and say, mm -hmm, okay, yeah, that's cool. But not re re recognizing that I'm responsible for your souls. God is holding me responsible, and that scares me to death. And that's why I would dare not in any, any forum, in any standing that I do, lead you in error, counsel you in error, or preach to you in error. Amen. I'm constantly praying to the Lord, please diminish me, humble me, which I know that he says that he's given me the power to humble myself. Amen. You know, so that I can be an instrument, and an instrument only, Speak to your people. You talk through me what you would have for them to hear. You know, that's why I stick with the word of God. And some of the things that I hear coming out of my mouth, I'm like, huh, who, where, where that, you know, it's the Holy Spirit. He's real, my brothers and sisters. He's real. Don't, don't, don't play the game this world is trying to toss you. He is real and he's alive in your life. And when we come together, he, he, he comes together as a, as, 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 oh, gracious, he's, he's elevated with him living in each one of us, and then we all come together in fellowship, and, and he becomes even more powerful, if I can even say that. But something wonderful happens. As we studied in Wednesday night Bible study, he manifests himself, which when you define that word manifest, and it's spoken twice in the same verse when he's talking about that, it's a vision of him as he lives within us coming out above us and around us to where he is truly teaching, protecting, guiding, and everything else that we are in need of. And it all comes from the word. Comes from the word. So I just wanted to share that so that, uh, but even on top of that, a, a loving deacon went out and said, Pastor, I want to bless you, and I, I want to see you living by God's word and dressed by God's word. He didn't say it quite like that, but that's what he was saying. He says, I bought you a robe. I said, okay. <laughs> but he promised, but he, he made me promise him that I wouldn't tell him who he was. And I'm not going to tell who he was. I can only tell you that he has a business cutting down trees, you know, so. So that way, I didn't tell you who he is, okay? God's going to bless him for his giving. And not just him. I mean, I'm receiving gifts from all over the place. And the other person is telling me, too, not to tell who they are, you know, because uh, she's a seamstress, and she doesn't want to be over powered by that, so I won't give you her name, but you know, I mean suits and dinner jackets and sports jackets and I mean shirts and stuff. I'm saying, Lord have mercy. You know, makes me feel like I'm a pimp. <laughs> but it's, it's such a blessing, it's such a blessing. And uh, my wife loves her to death, so it ain't nothing that she's trying to slide through the side door, you know. But, She's being blessed. God's going to bless her immensely. So I won't tell you her name either. Then, then, then there's another one right here that I won't tell you her name. You know, just 
donating out of her pocket. The church don't need to pay for that. I'll pay for that. When we were trying to get the website together, Amen. took out of her pocket and says, don't, don't even vouch that to the church. I'll pay and take care of it. And uh, yeah. I won't tell you who she is. You know, it's a person that drives the bus for us. So, you know, I won't call no names. So you won't know who she is. Okay. But God's going to bless her immensely. Amen. So you can see, I kept the confidentiality of all of them that's doing the giving. You know. Amen, amen, amen. Father, we thank you. It is so wonderful that you are our Lord and our Savior, and that you give us the space and opportunity to be joyful and, and joking and, and just being uh, uh, lovers of each other that we can just sing and embrace each other and be happy in the fact that we are believers. You know, I just thank you for that, that privilege. And now, Father, as we come down to your word, we do take this serious moment to ask you, first of all, Lord, that you would forgive me of my sins and forgive those who are hearing the word of their sins, and that you would make us anew Refresh us in your, your love and in your spirit. Pray, Father, that you would allow me to humble myself and that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit. You speak to your people. Allow me to be nothing more than your instrument. And God, we'll give you the glory and give you the praise for what you will say. Bless us now, for it is in Jesus' name that we pray. And all of us shall say together, amen, and praise the Lord. Amen. What a wonderful day, beautiful day, blessed day. God is doing blessing like you wouldn't believe blessing. I, I know you all heard the, the news. One of our brothers here has been contacted by the Biden administration. And he himself, President Biden, is warning him on the transportation board, the National Transportation Board. Y'all know who he is. Yes, my brother and friend, Mayor Alvin Brown. You know, God, God, you know, when, when, you, when you are just embracing God's business, God says, I will elevate you. He says, if you embrace me, if you love me, he says, I will bless you. But he says, if you harm me, attack me, reject me, he says, I will curse you. And so on both hands, one side or the other side. So the question always with each one, which side of the hand of God you want to be on? On the side where he's blessing or on the side where he's cursing? That's not what I was going to preach about today. But I just wanted to let you know, give you an update and a snippet on the fact that God is blessing St. Joseph. His, he, he is blessing. This morning I want to just bring a, a message and I'm going to try to be as brief as I can. It's coming out of 1 Peter and allow me to, to read the verses again and I'll read them in the New Living Translation if you don't mind. And uh, follow along with me with your eyes, your heart, uh, either one, as I read aloud. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy that we have been born again. Because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Now we live with great expectation. And we have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay. Verse 5. And through your faith, God is protecting you by his power until you receive this salvation, which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. So be truly glad. There is wonderful joy ahead, even though you have to endure many trials for a little while. 
And these trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire test and purifies gold. Though your faith is far more precious than mere gold, so when your faith remains strong and through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when the Lord Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. You love him even though you have never seen him. Though you do not see him now, you trust him and you rejoice with a joyous, inexpressible joy. And verse nine, the reward for trusting him will be the salvation of your souls. I want to talk to you just a few minutes this morning on this thought. Our trials are God's plans. Our trials are God's plans. The troubles that you see in your life is God's plan. Give an honor to the men that are with me on the pulpit, Reverend Gibson, Reverend Fisher, to the wonderful deacons of this great church. So good to see you this morning. You're all over, bless your heart. Good to see you. To the deaconess, all right. So good to see Sister Simmons. You know, bless your heart. Amen. To the choir, as always, you are blessing mightily. To the musician, which is, where is it? There he is, Brother Simpkins. There he is. Bless your heart. And Sister Teresa, Amen. you know, as Pastor Williams used to say, as she beats on them drums, you do a wonderful job, my dear. You are blessing. To, um, who else am I looking at? The deaconess. Well, I'm going to get there, showing up. Yeah, I'm going to get there. <laughs> to the, the ushers in their stately positions and to the multimedia center and, and also to the wonderful, wonderful, wonderful family of St. Joseph. Amen. You know, wonderful family of St. Joseph who are so loving and so supportive and truly are God's people and I truly bless, bless your name, bless you in where, where you are and what you stand for. And now to my darling wife, God bless you, my dear. Truly, she takes good care of me, I'm telling you. Took me 32 years to train her, but I finally got her where she, where she trained. Although, like, I don't even have to pop my fingers anymore. I just get up and get it like this. She knows exactly what happened, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Y'all believe that? <laughs> But she is so wonderful, I'm telling you. Again, I want to talk to you this morning. Our troubles, our trials, are simply God's plans in your life. There's a purpose for it. So since there is a purpose for it, God tells us some things that we should do to recognize it and allow it to be a blessing to us. You know, we are not like the heathens that are out there that the Bible speaks of that don't know God, that don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, where we see troubles and trials or something to destroy us. You know, God is doing what he does, no matter how you may define it, as things to bless us, to strengthen us, to move us in a direction that we need to go. And so we want to recognize that anytime we see the trials that are coming in our life, that we can start the rejoicing and start the grinning and start the laughing inwardly as strongly as we can because we know that God is working in our lives some kind of way. He's got some kind of plan. He does not bring those things in your life to cause you to stumble or to have you to have heartbreaks in the middle of the night. That's not why God does that. You are his child. You wouldn't do it to your own child. And he says to us, I'm greater than you are. He says, I wouldn't give you a snake when you're looking for a piece of bread or a piece of meat. I wouldn't give you a rock if you were looking for 
a piece of bread. He says that I love you greater than you love your own children. And so I will not do these things to harm you. And so when you see these trials coming in your life, I want you to rejoice. I want you to put your trust in me. And when you put your trust in me, wonderful things start to happening in your life. The first thing, there are three things, of course, I like to, to bring out whenever I do uh, present a sermon so that you'll have something to set your hands on. Uh, the first one is that God's purpose for our trials. That's the first thing, God's purpose for our trials. God has a purpose for the trials that come into your life. And that purpose really surrounds the idea of the great inheritance that he's got planned for us. He tells us in his word that he's got things planned for us, my brothers and sisters, that's beyond our comprehension. I don't care how you would sit down at a desk and do research and find out what prosperity is and, and what's uh, contained in that and build it all up and say, this is where the ultimate of, of prosperity would be. God says it's greater than that. It is greater than your mind can ever calculate. And I believe that's one of the reasons why we can't go to glory in this flesh. Because what he has for us, what's in paradise, is so wonderful that this flesh could not, could, could not stand it. His love is so, so, so huge and so, so out, of, out of touch with us until we could not comprehend it in our flesh. And so that's one of the reasons why he translates us. We call it dying, but it's not dying for a believer. He translates us from this phase to the next phase, to where we start to enjoy his presence. Oh, man, I, I can imagine that, that what's going on in paradise while, while everybody is waiting for, for, for us all to come, is, 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 it, it will put you in a sense of being jealous. If you would hear Paul talk about it, you know, Paul talked about it as if he was jealous. He says, you know, left to me, I, I would prefer being there where he is. He says, but I know that I need to be here. If I have my choice in the matter, you know, because Paul was taken up into the heavens and he was shown things that no man has ever been shown before. He saw some of the stuff. God didn't show it all to him because he couldn't comprehend it. He was still in flesh. But God showed him some of the stuff and then told him, don't share it with mankind. But even with the little bit that he saw, it was beyond his imagination. And so Paul, after that, said that, hey, uh, left to me, I'd rather be there. But I know that I'm needed here. And so that's where we are today you know if you truly knew what God was planning for you you would probably have a mindset in that same place that's one of the reasons why when we know that a believer is, is transitioning when they are passing from this life and going on that in a sense in our hearts we should be rejoicing knowing that they are just moments from the presence of God Almighty from the Lord Jesus Christ and for the beginning of what their inheritance all means so God says that I bring trials in your life and the reason is for you to be prepared for what I have for you. Right now in this flesh, we have what might even be called spiritual depression. You know, some of us feel stripped of any, any notion, any energy, any hope. Or it, it seems to be drawn from us. And, and even if we go to doctors, sometimes it don't seem like the doctors can do nothing about it. And we stay in, in, in that state. It's, the Bible looks at it as spiritual depression. And Jesus says to us that one of the purposes for our trials is to restore us to a living hope. That, that, that's what the word is, is saying to us. In, in verses 3 and 4, all, all praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy that we have been born again. It's by his mercy for us, because we didn't deserve it. The Bible says he saved us while we were yet in our sins, while we were being disobedient and contrary to God, rejecting him in our actions in every kind of way. It's when God saved us. Isn't that something? That, 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 that's a God really to love and to worship because he loved us so much until he did not take our faults in consideration 
when he decided to save us. And, and, and then, then it goes on and says, because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead, now we live with great expectation. Look at verse 4. And we have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you. That's what he's doing. That's what the trials are for, is to equip us and to work with us and to chip away certain things that God sees that's in us, that's making us not fit for heaven and for the inheritance that he has. I, I wish there was some way for, no, I'm going to take that back because I don't. I don't want to go there right now. To, I, I was going to say, I kind of wish God would kind of like let me see what some of that is so I could have some kind of idea to preach, but I, I don't take that back. I don't, I don't, I, I don't want that. I, I'll stick with God's word and trust his word and let his word express to me that, that sentiment. But, but he says to us that, that uh, uh, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for us, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of, of change and of joy. In other words, that what he has for us, there is nothing that Satan can do to change it or to, to make it not what God has. God has it and he has protected it for each one of us. And each one of us has specific things that God is blessing us with. Not all of us have all of the things in common. God has each one of us in mind. It's not like a, a cookie cutter that all of this goes to this group and all of this goes. No, no, God has each one of us in mind and our inheritance is based on that. God knows exactly what he has and what he wants for us to be and, and for us to have while we're in, in eternity with him. The next thing that, that points out God's purpose for our, our trials is trials prove that we are kept by his power. That's one of my favorites. It proves to us that as we are working through these trials that he sends our way or that he allows to happen, he lets us see that the only reason that we are not being destroyed by these trials is because he's keeping us by his power. That, that, that he's causing us to be strong in the midst of the, of the trials that's coming along. That we are greater than the trials. That's, that, that's what God is doing. So it should bless our hearts in knowing this because it lets us know that we belong to God. Look at verse 5. And, though, and through, our, through our faith, God is protecting us by his power until we receive this salvation which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. Our salvation, the full package of our salvation, which includes our inheritance and everything else that God has planned, is going to be opened up and revealed to us when we're in glory. Not while we're here on earth, but when we're in glory. Now, the, the, we will receive beautiful consequences of our faith and of, our, of our, our love for one another and everything while we're here, but that has nothing to do with our inheritance and in, in, in glory. Because it is much greater than any of that. We, we, we cannot even calculate it. We cannot put any kind of reason to it. God is above all of that. And the only thing that we can do is by faith recognizing that something is going to happen that's going to blow our literal minds. And that God is the one who is in control of it and it's going to be God being the one who hands it to us. Our inheritance. And then... The third thing that shows that God's purpose for our trials is that our trials restores our joy. How, how, how many of us have, have, have lost hope, have lost joy, have been getting to the point to where we don't even really care if the door opens or not? How, how many that get to a point to where it just don't seem like nothing we're doing works right? No matter how we're raising our child, it seems like our child is taking the other direction. And so we lose the desire to even try to do anything. How many of us have tried everything that you could possibly could within your marriages? And then it seems like the more that you try, the, the more of the opposite direction that, that marriage seems to go. And then with that, our joy goes with it. And so we, we walk around now with a, with, with a heart we know is saved and born again, but the joy has been diminished. But then God knows that, so what he does, he sends trials in our lives. 
you know, that, 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 that wakes us up because we can't ignore them. He brings his trials such that we have to pay attention to it. And then in that, we don't even see it, but he is developing us to where we can either tolerate, put up with, or that he actually changes the situation. But it's all in God's hand. It, it, it's all focused on who we are because the whole idea is to return the joy that we once have. Because we cannot be productive, prosperous believers, Christians, for the world to see if we're walking around with no hope and no joy. And so God is faithful to do that, but he does it through trials. He does it through, through situations in life that causes us discomfort. That's why James says, when you see trials, he said, you should be rejoicing. He says, I just rejoice when if I see trials. He says, matter of fact, I look for the trials because I know that somewhere in that there's going to be joy, that God's going to be operating, and that on the other side of it is going to have me, have me better fit for the calling that God has brought in my life. So James says, I get excited when I see trials. You know, that, that, that sounds kind of idiotic in a way, but as believers and God that's in control, it should be that we trust God so much that we are so close to him that, that he is so dear to our spirit that when we see situations that are not like what we want, when we see trials and tribulations coming our life, that we start saying, you know, oh, God is about to work something in my life and start to rejoice. And instead of getting all scared and frustrated and, and drained of your joy and drained of your hope, that there should be an excitement that comes in your heart knowing that I don't understand what God is doing, but I know that he's doing something. But then in another area, I'm going to bring to you the fact that there's a way to even get to a point to understand what God is doing. God does not want his people walking around with that attitude and with that spirit and not knowing why they're in that situation. God is, God, God is very concerned with us on that path. So, so we've talked about God's purpose for our trials. You know, trials restore us to us a living hope. Trials prove we are kept by his power. And trials restores our joy. Now let's look at the second thing that, that, that he talks about with trials. He says our response to our trials. He, he's concerned about how we respond to the trials. Again, we are his children. God is not sitting up in heaven and dropping rocks on us just for the joy of laughing. You know, with his angels, look, watch, watch EC here. Let me drop this rock on his head. You know, that, that's, that's not what God is doing. He's not playing games with us. He's not up there playing lotto with the, with the angels or the holy ones and stuff, trying to discourage us. That's not what God is doing. God is working everything that's possible to fit us for glory. Amen. That's what God is doing. So he's concerned about our response to what he's doing. So one of the things we look at when we see trials, first of all, the first thing that comes as far as our response is that trials will bring grief. That's the first thing. When we see trials coming out of life, that's our first response. It goes, oh, Lord, what's going on now? Oh, Jesus, not again. Lord, I thought we dealt with this last week. You know, why, why are you, you know, that's our first response. That, that, that's human. Don't let that be a discouraging issue. That's human. That's the first thing that, that's going to happen. There's going to be grief. There's going to be confusion in our minds as to why God is bringing those trials in our life. I'm coming to church. I'm tithing. I'm, I'm trying my best to love my sisters and my brothers. And, and uh, I'm doing what I think I ought to do, you know. But yet and still, here's trials coming. Oh, Lord, what's going on? So God is saying to us, look, look at verse 6. So be truly glad. There is wonderful joy ahead, even though you have to endure many trials for a little while. Oh, wow. He says to us that there's grief because we have to suffer trials for a little while. But look at the other comment he makes, which brings up my next sub point here. We rejoice in trials. Because we are seeing God's actions. In verse, verse 6, he says, here, you, have, you, you have to endure many trials for a little while because there's wonderful joy ahead. 
So he is saying to us that you're going to see my actions in why I'm bringing these trials. And the whole idea in that is for us to understand that we're his children. God says to us overall, he says, when you see me doing things in your life that's sometimes not comfortable, he says, rejoice. He says, because I'm correcting you. In other words, I'm spanking your behind, your backside. And you should be glad because then you know that you are my child and that you are not a bastard. This is biblical. So when we see God dealing in our lives, we should rejoice, first of all, knowing that, oh, my father is, is acting in my life. I don't know what's going on, but I'm getting ready to find out. He says rejoice in the fact that, 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 that I am working in your life. So, so one of the responses is that we rejoice. We, we, we thank God for doing what he's doing in our life. Then the third thing he says to us as far as our response to our trials. Here we go. We must request wisdom in trials from God. We must request the wisdom of God in our trials. Not from our neighbors, not from our close buddy, not from some person that we think that is educated enough how to do a sale, our first response is to go to God. James says in, in chapter 1, verse 5, he says, if we need wisdom, ask God, and he will give it to us. He will not rebu rebuke us for asking. Now, that verse has been misused because we think that, okay, I want to be a wise man or wise woman over everything. I just want to be wise. So I'm going to pray to God this scripture and Lord give me the wisdom like, like uh, Solomon did. But that's not what that scripture is saying. That scripture is saying that God, first of all, James set it up, trials and tribulations. That's what he's talking about in chapter 1. God is going to be sending trials and tribulations in your life. But you do, the only way that you can learn from it is to know why God is sending it. Isn't it wonderful for you to know that when mama takes a switch out and started beating you behind while you fast asleep, that you'd want to know why she's doing it? It makes the whipping not so bad because you know that, oh man, I messed up, I ain't gonna mess up no more. But to, to wake up with a beating going on and you can't find out what you've done wrong makes that beating horrible because you can't figure out what's going on. So what God is saying is that when I am spanking you, when I am bringing trials in your life and tribulations, he says to us is to ask him without a doubting mind, without a mind that's all messed up and, 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 and half-witted and full of doubt. Ask with confidence knowing that God uh, will, 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 will respond to us. He says, ask him. And he says that I will give it to you Unbridled. I will give it to you completely, not muddled down without conflict or confusion. I will make it clear to you why these trials are coming into your life. And then when you find out why these trials are coming, then God is expecting for you to do the second thing. In 1 John chapter 9 and 10, he's expecting for you then to confess your sin, to confess to him why he's beating your behind, why he's bringing those trials. Confess to him and then make a turn. Make a turn away from it. That's the steps that he's given us through God's word to, to really make a difference in your life. But our response to trials, first of all, it brings grief. Nobody wants to be spanked. Nobody wants trials. Second of all, we are to rejoice because we are seeing God acting in our life. The first thing is to just know that God loves us and we're his child. That, that in itself is enough to rejoice behind because sometimes we wonder whether we really are his child. But then we see him uh, correcting us and then we can say, oh, Lord, I am his child. Even though it's hurting, even though it's breaking my heart, even though it's disturbing me on my path of what I'm doing, I'm confident that I'm his child. Now let me find out why I'm being spanked. And the third thing is to request that wisdom to find out why he's bringing those trials so that you can start to changing whatever actions that you are performing that's displeasing to him. And then thirdly, God's plans 
in our trials. God's plans in our trials. The first one is, is, is concerned with for our trials, God's purpose for our trials. Second one is, is our response to our trials. And now we're talking about God's plans in our trials. So while we're going through the tribulations, God's got a plan. It's not, again, just because he is just doing stuff just to cause us uh, 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 an uncomfortable uh, uh, situation. But the main thing to understand when, it, when we started dealing with God and understanding the difference, God, to his children, children, he never punishes us. He punishes the unbeliever. He never punishes us. He corrects us. There's a big difference. When a person has been found guilty of something and sent to the big house for 30 years, that's punishment. They're not intended to make no correction in him or fit him for society. They, they're, they're punishing him. When they send him to the electric chair, they're punishing him. They're not trying to correct him. But when, they, when you're sent there, you know, with whatever, I, won't know, I don't know the number, I won't put no number of years there, but when you're sent there with the idea of fixing or helping you to, to correct your life so that you can re-enter society, that's not a punishment. That's correction. And that's what God does with his believers. He never punishes us because punishment has no no measures of correction. All God wants to do is bring his wrath down on them and then that's it. But he does not with the believers because he's already done it in your life because he did it to Jesus Christ who was our representative. He did it to his own son. He placed his wrath on his own son because of situations that you brought in your life. So all of the sins, all of the things that you've done that's against God, God brought his wrath, his punishment on his own son. So therefore, he will never, never, ever bring punishment upon you because you're not guilty of anything. You're not guilty of anything. The blood of Jesus to those who are believers have taken care of all those things on Calvary's cross. You will never be punished. The trials that come in your life are not for punishment. Don't ever feel that, oh, this is the end. I don't know how I'm going to come out of it. I don't think that I'm going to come out of it. There, there, there is no, there, there's nothing for me to look for, for hope. There's, there can be no joy in the midst of this. This is all I'm doing now, just counting down the time. This is all, no, 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 for a believer, that is not the response we should have, no matter how grave that we think the situation is. For a believer, when we see situations come in our life like that, we need to recognize that God has a plan in the midst of our trials, that his plan is to fix us for whatever he has in mind for us. When, when, when he's wanting to call you to be whatever, uh, 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 to, uh, as a singer, uh, he, he will do things to, to, to fix you and start to moving you in a direction to, to move into that, that, into that calling. If it's a preacher, he just doesn't pick a preacher up and put him here and then say, go for it. That's not what Jesus does. Now he picks them up and put them there and wash them clean. Then he says, prepare yourself for what I have for you. Now in the midst of preparing yourself is where you're gonna see the trials and tribulations in your life. But there's a plan that God has in the midst of that because he's preparing you for something that he has for you to do in his kingdom. God is concerned about strengthening you for the kingdom's work, not for punishment, not for destruction. So trials strengthen us for one purpose only, and that's for us to learn to trust him that much more. That's what the trials are for. That, that, that's, that's the plan that God has in the midst of that, is to strengthen us to trust him. Amen. Trials cause us to truly learn to be sympathetic to others. We can't bless others unless we can feel in our heart the hurt that they are experiencing in their life. 
you know, when I have an issue and I'm talking to a brother that's been nowhere near and he's telling me, oh, it's going to be okay, I roll my eyes at him. Because in my heart, you haven't demonstrated to me that you really know how bad my heart is hurting. So I hear what you're saying and so forth, but really, what is the remedy? That, that, that's the response that we take. So, so, so trials, God has plans in it so that you are able to sympathize or empathize with others. Because you're here to bless each other. That's why we're left here. And so God's plan is to, to get us to that point. And he wants us to always remember that trials are never to defeat or destroy us. It's never to do that. It is there to prepare us for glory and to prepare us for the kingdom's work that he has for us here. You need to know that our trials that we see in our life is God's plans in our life. Remember that God is working. His hand is working. Don't fall down and say, oh, it's all over. God, I give it up. Or get so frustrated, even with the church, and say, I'm so sick of this church, I'm going to head to another church. I'm going to tell you what. You believe it or not, you're going to find the same mess at the next church that you're trying to run away from. You can't run from what God has placed you because he has a purpose for your life. If he's prepared you for that kind of mess that you are seeing, then he's going to move you, or not move you, but when you run away from him, you're going to run away to that same mess somewhere else because he's prepared you to deal with that kind of mess. So you stand still and say, oh, Lord, I hate that I'm here, but why you got me? What's going on? Find out why and what your purpose is, and you will find your life a whole lot better because then you start to walk and get in line with what God has planned for your life. Stop running from him. Stop thinking that if I do this, then, then this will happen. No, if you started doing what God is instructing you to do and what God is doing in your life and trying to prepare you for it, then you'll find the joy that you're looking for. Then you'll find the hope, the joy and the hope that you're looking for. Amen. So God has a purpose in his trials that he's bringing in your life. And Jesus knew that we were going to have all these kinds of stuff. Yeah, Sister Sadie, I'm going to go to the cross. He knew, he knew that we would have these frustrations. He knew that we would be falling apart. That he knew that we would not understand why these trials were in our life. He knew that we would fall down in the midst of those trials. So he, he came to this world to be our representative. He came to this world to fit us so that we were better suited to be the people, the Christians that God was calling for for this time. So he started off by taking the weight of the sins off of us because see, that's what burdens us. The reason that a lot of times we can't do what we think we wanna do is because we all burdened down with sins in our life that's gone unconfessed. God is saying that I came to remove those so that you wouldn't have to be burdened down. But you have a part in this. I want you to recognize that I'm operating in your life and I want you to repent. I want you to recognize what I'm doing and, and why I'm doing it so that you can confess in your secret closet to me. Agree with me that this is where your area is in life. But he started off by coming down and showing us that he could live this life holy. And he did. The Bible said he lived it without any sin. Because he was God in flesh. We are people in flesh with God living in us. But he was God who came in flesh. The same as our flesh. But the people didn't understand it. So they were all upset about it because he was causing such an uproar. You know, this man named Jesus Christ in three years turned this world upside down 2,000 years ago, and it ain't been turned around again. It is, it is, it is, it is he, he brought a plan into this world until it just caused everything to stop in its track. In three years, not 30 years, not 100 years, not 40 years, not, but three years. But they took him to the cross. Or rather, God took his own son to the cross. They thought he was, and God wanted them to think that they, they were doing that. But Jesus humbly took himself. He allowed the Father to guide him to Calvary's hill. 
so that he could be nailed on a cross to complete scripture, to fulfill scripture. And they nailed him to a cross. According to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 4, they nailed him to a cross. And on that cross, according to the scriptures, he died. He died a death, and it has to be said that no other man has, 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 has experienced. You know, when we say death, we say, you know, well, Jesus died. What's the difference? In it? No, 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 no. According to, to the explanation that we have, as best as we can see, the Bible says that the death that God is talking about is a complete separation from him. Now, how God separated himself from himself during those three days and three nights, we will never understand. But that, 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 that is the definition that God has. To be to where God is not present, we can't even imagine what that's like. Where total sin has total control. We have no idea what that is about. But that's where Jesus was for three days and three nights. Taking our place. But the Bible said on that cross he did die. And they took him off of the cross and they put him in a barred tomb. So that while he in his spirit could do what he needed to do, that God has sent him to this world to do. But he ministered and did all stuff that we would never, ever be able to understand during those three days and three nights. Yes, he was in the midst of hell. He preached to those who were in Abraham's bosom, and he also preached across the gulf to those that were in, in hell itself, demonstrating that here's the son that the prophet spoke about. There was a lot of stuff that he did. But then God said that because he completed everything that I sent him in the world to do, the Bible says in, in, in uh, Psalm number two, last verse, he says, I kissed my son and raised him from the dead. Bodily and alive on the third day morning, he rose from the dead. And see, here's the, here's the thing that we need to hold on to and rejoice about because if he had not complete his, his, his work in totality, if he had left even one sin undealt with, that God could not have raised his son from the dead. Because God is holy, he's not a liar, and, and, he, and his word is not false. Amen. But we should have holy hope in our hearts. And knowing that every sin, so when we do sin, when we do mess, don't, it's not the end of the world. That, that whatever sin that is, God knew about it before the foundation of the world, and he would not have been able to have his son pay the penalty for it. Don't let that be the reason why you give up. Don't let it be the reason why you move on somewhere else or why you do stuff that is unmentionable. Because God says, I've forgiven you already. So he rose from the dead, bodily and alive. And he ministered for about 40 days on earth. And on the 40th day, he, was, he ascended into heaven, where he's sitting on the right hand of the Father, even right now, interceding for each of us. Even right now, when we mess around and sin and whatever, you know, and the devil pokes it out, because that's what the Bible said. He's, he's there pimping us out. They, they don't use the word pimp in the Bible. But, that, but that's what he's doing, poking and saying, Lord, see there, God, see there. You said he's a, he's a believer. You see there, but the Bible says Jesus, Jesus, in his glory, he defends us and, 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 and plead the blood that he shed it. And then God is, he's faithful to heaven to forgive us of whatever we've done. That's going on right now. Amen. I mean, anybody would be, and I'm going to say it, a fool not to receive the blessings that God has in store for us. You would be a total fool not to receive it. And so now I'm going to, on behalf of the church, extend an invitation. The invitation is simple. There's, I'm going to just do two parts. The first part is for salvation. While we stand, recognizing the Holy Spirit as he's working right now, honoring him. There may be someone that the Holy Spirit is speaking to our heart, saying that you need to truly allow me to come into your life. 
open your heart right now and allow Jesus to come in. That's what he's saying. You may not be able to understand it, but if he's nudging your heart, that's what he's trying to say to you. If you're not a sinner, I mean, if you're not a believer, then that's what God is trying to do, is enter your heart. If that's the situation, I'm inviting you on behalf of St. Joseph to come and give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. The second invitation is to, to come if you've been away or if you do not have a church home or you want to come and be a part of this ministry from some other ministry by, by letter, by profession of faith. Why don't you just simply come? Just come. Oh, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Yes. Praise the Lord. Yes. Amen. Praise the Lord. Yes. 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 God is in control. The Holy Spirit is working even at this moment. Why don't you come? Why don't you come? Why don't you come? Why don't you come? have done what God has asked and there is still room at the cross you may be seated yes it's our courtesy committee we're going to get to uh, to worship and giving and all the rest we have reactivated our courtesy ministry sister Raheem and sister Tompkins okay giving honor to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to Pastor Gregory, the pulpit, members and friends, good afternoon. My name is Sister Raheem and the Curtis Ministry. At this time, I would like to acknowledge our visitors. Are there any visitors today? Will you please stand and give your name and church affiliation, please? On behalf of the pastor and the St. Joseph family, we would like to thank you for worshiping with us today. We have been blessed by your presence here. And remember, this is the church where everybody is somebody and Jesus Christ is Lord, ever so and black bottom. Thank you all for coming and please come again. Thank you. Thank you. Weren't they beautiful? Amen. Senator Gibson, it's so good to see you. If you got a word, I'll give you a minute or two if there's a, something you want to say. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Hello, there it is, thank you. Well, good afternoon again, St. Joseph. Um, you all are no stranger, and I know I'm no stranger to you all. Um, I just wanted to make sure I stopped by this morning 
And thank you so much, Pastor, for allowing me just a couple of seconds. And you know, you know, I've been uh, fighting in Tallahassee for a number of years. It's not a daily fight. Sometimes, sometimes it's kind of a little smooth. But most of the time, you have to say, listen, I will not accept that for my people. I will not support that for my folks. This is not right. And I can tell you, um, not only is the legislature in this country divided, um, our city, I, I say our city is on fire. Yes. Right? Um, not literally, but literally. Um, there's, we cannot have division in the city where we live and pay taxes every single day. We may not, we all may not necessarily agree, but I believe in consensus. Because in consensus, not everybody gets what they want, right. but everybody gets what they need. Yes. Right. And so um, after much thought, and this is even before they took our congressional seat from us, I wanted to stay home and work on building those relationships, work on changing our community, and work on getting those promises to us that was promised years ago that we're still paying for today. You guys know what I'm talking about, consolidation. Yes, yes. Um, and how people don't understand, Pastor. So the gas tax, now it's intended to do infrastructure projects in different communities. Well, if you look at the list, first of all, it's not prioritized. So you don't know if you're first, second, third, or last. The other thing is that people didn't understand and I'll take my seat after this and I'll let you know that I am running for mayor in 2023. The gas, people didn't understand that gas doesn't cost the same everywhere. And so I was really amazed to find out that a sitting city council person didn't know that. And I said, so what you need to understand about the gas taxes, yes, it pays for projects, but our folks are pay still paying for things that we were promised to our ancestors. Mm -hmm. So we're still paying for that and we shouldn't be. So in different neighborhoods, gas does not cost the same thing. So I'm glad you guys get it. Yeah, and so they're saying, the idea was that they would do a gas tax because everybody pays equally. Everybody doesn't pay equally. Because as you say, if gas is 30 cent more on our side of town, we're, we're not paying the same thing, are we? We're paying more. They didn't even understand that. So I just wanted to make sure um, I get this, continue to get this word out. Some people know, some don't. So spread the word that I'm going to bring my experience and my connections and my tenacity to the office of mayor and to make things fair for people in Jacksonville and particularly those who haven't been treated fairly over, over the years, and they're descendants, right? We're, we're descendants of people who were promised things. So my faith is strong, and I'm trudging forward, and I would greatly appreciate you all's, may I ask? Well, thank you. Help and support. Thank, thank you, you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much. I just wanted to be sure, I just wanted to be sure that we give a minute. I know I'm gonna get in trouble, but that's okay. Amen. 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 Okay. Great afternoon, St. Joseph family. Oh, it is a blessing today to stand before you. As always, as always. But today a little extra special heart. Um, we have the brand list. <laughs> and we'll talk with Cheryl and yeah. Okay, so they do come uh, desire membership, re-membership, and their Christian experience. Amen. To God be the glory. Welcome to Brantley. All Pastor? Right. You were there, yes. Amen. Amen. Oh, yeah. My brother. You all don't understand the love that I have for this couple, and especially to this brother that goes back years and years and years. But... Uh, it, you don't know how in my heart is so glad to see you all coming home, man. I'm telling you. Just like my brother is coming home. I'm telling you. So good. You're still as pretty as ever. I'm telling you the truth. Yeah, that's as pretty. Uh, oh, I stay in trouble, darling. That's how I know that I'm still married. In trouble. 
things are going smooth, I get to wonder what's going on. <laughs> I'm just joking. I'm just playing, honey. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm so glad that you decided to come back. And uh, the uh, ministry on new disciples will, you know, just talk with you and update you on uh, changes that we may have or what's going on. So they'll contact you and then uh, uh, make it just so easy for the transition about that you won't even feel the difference. Amen? Amen. 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 I'm glad that you guys came. All right. You may go back to your seat. Bless you. Bless you. Bless you. That's it? Okay. Let everybody say Amen. Let everybody say Amen. Let everybody say I got a question for the church school class. Did he answer all your questions in that message today? Didn't he hit on all of them? That ain't nobody but God. Didn't he hit on all of them? Didn't he hit on them? Didn't he, Sister Smith? Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let us now prepare our hearts for worship and giving. thank you today thank you for your word and now uh, will you please prepare our hearts for worship and giving as only you can so that can be used for the upbuilding of uh, your kingdom in Jesus name we do pray amen excited right now. He, he just preached the church school. Uh, cuz, I'm waiting on you. I'm excited, y'all. Y'all got to forgive me right now. I am. Uh, ushers, will you check the vestibule it is now time for our covenant as we prepare ourselves for the Lord's Supper. 
the Lord's table. If you if you're able to stand, will you please? If you're not, just stay seated. And there's anything in this covenant that you're still doing. When God's ready to move it, guess what he'll do? He'll do it. Having been led as we believe, by the Spirit of God, to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, and on the confession of our faith, Having been baptized in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the, Son, and of the, Holy, Ghost, and of the Holy Ghost, we do now in the presence of God, angels, and this assembly, most solemnly and joyfully, enter into covenant with one another, as one body in Christ. We engage, therefore, we engage, therefore, by the aid of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit to, walk to walk together in Christian love, to strive for the advancement of this church, to strive for the advancement of this church in, knowledge, in knowledge, holiness, holiness and, comfort, and comfort, to promote its prosperity and spirituality, to, spirituality, to sustain its worship, Ordinances, ordinances, disciplines, disciplines and, doctrines, and doctrines to contribute cheerfully and regularly to the support of the ministry, the expenses of the church, the relief of the poor, and the spread of the gospel through all nations. We also engage to maintain family and secret devotion. To, rel to religiously educate our children, to, educate our children. To, seek to seek the salvation of our kindred and acquaintances, faithful in our, to be just in our dealings, just in our dealings. faithful in our engagements, in our and exemplary in our deportment, in our deportment. To, avoid to avoid all tattling, backbiting, and excessive, anger, and excessive anger to abstain from the sale and use of, use of intoxicating drinks as a beverage and, and to be zealous in our efforts to advance the kingdom of our Savior. We, watch, we further engage, we further engage to, watch to watch over one another in brotherly love to remember each other in prayer, to aid each other in sickness and distress, to cultivate Christian sympathy and feelings, and courtesy in speech, to be slow to take offense, but always ready for reconciliation, and mindful of the rules of our Savior, to secure, it to secure it without delay. We moreover engage, we moreover engage that, when we that when we remove from this place, we will as soon as possible, as soon as possible unite with some other church, with some other church where, we can carry out the spirit of this covenant where we can carry out the spirit of this covenant and the principles of God's word. And the of God's word. Amen. ordained preachers, ordained deacons, licensed preachers, we come now to observe the Lord's table. We ask now that that you will secure all your wondering thoughts. Jesus said, 
as often as we do this, we do show forth his death until he comes again. This is the Lord's table. One of our sacred observations that we have in this church. We want this to be clear. And understand that you know what Jesus personally done for you. We want you to just concentrate on Jesus. We want you to concentrate so hard that you can hear the nails piercing his skin. Because those nails was intended for us. But Jesus took it upon himself for our sins. We're going to ask Reverend Gibson to pray for us, to prepare us to observe the Lord's table. And Father, again, we do thank you for Jesus. Because without him, we would be nothing, and we are nothing. So we ask now that you will forgive us of our sins, and that you will make us ready to receive your table. You know all about it. You know what you ordained. We don't have a clue. But you prepared this before the foundation of the world. And so we're trusting you. Bless the elements that we're about to receive. Breathe on the St. Joseph family as only you can. Bless us now in Jesus' name. Amen. everyone been served or better has anyone been omitted if so please raise your hand
the scripture says on that same night in which Jesus was betrayed he took the bread he blessed the bread and he broke the bread he says this bread is broken my body is broken in remembrance of me eat and likewise he took the fruit of the vine he said this fruit of vine is a new testament in my blood Jesus said in remembrance of me drink But as he went out, the Bible said he sung a song, sung a hymn, Jesus did, and they never recorded what he actually sung. But he was saying, Joseph, we sing, Jesus keep me near the cross. And like our pastor used to say, I want you to sing with lifted voices, sing with bold voices, knowing that it's all about Jesus and his shed blood.
service today and thank you for we know that you called us to worship and so we bless you and all that you have done through each one of us today as we saw fit to lift your son Jesus. Father, my prayer is, is that we will leave here today, all of us, and recognizing that our trials are your plans. That your trials come when we fall in error and you bring trials to bring us back to where you want us to be, to renew our hope, to re re replenish our joy. And so we thank you for that message and that word. And now, Father, as we come to our benediction. And now unto him who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant, it's he who we lift, who we praise, and who we depend upon for our salvation. It is to him that we're asking that you would keep us and bless us until we're together again as a family in St. Joseph. And all of your saints shall say together, Amen. Amen. Amen.